Distinguished dignitaries on the dais, Madam Mrs. Ramchandran, distinguished invitees. First of all, let me thank uh, the organizers, the trustees of Sanmati, and the very eminent promoters who are behind it for having invited me. And I, I do realize it's a, it's a huge privilege. Now, why me? I think I have a couple of jobs spelled out to me very clearly. First of all, as a, a non-psychiatrist medical professional, I bring a certain perspective to the problem. Why Sanmati? I think in my opinion, it's long overdue. I'm very happy that eventually it is been brought forth by a group of very talented psychiatrists. The problem is almost a cliche to say that the problem of mental illness is growing. We all know that. But what's alarming is the extent to which it's growing. And in fact, we heard Mrs. Lakshmi Rangarajan quote the figure of about 20% of the population. One in five of all of us sitting here is in serious trouble. And that's a sobering thought. In fact, one in five of the people sitting on the dais could be in serious trouble. So, so we really are looking at a major public health issue. And to address this issue, what about the professionals? As an ENT surgeon, I keep constantly cribbing that there are not enough ENT surgeons in this country, and we are 8,000 people in this country. And I was shocked to know that the psychiatrists are only 4,000. Of course, it's good news for the psychiatrists. There's never going to be a dearth of patients, but it's bad news for society. So it's really a need for an organized effort to look after promoting mental health, preventing mental illness, early detection, and eventually intervention and management. So I think this is very clearly spelled out. The task for Sanmati is spelled out. Now I need to also recall and, and say a few words at least about the gentleman in whose memory this effort is being propagated and perpetuated. Professor V. Ramchandran was a giant of a man. He was a giant of a personality. At a time when psychiatry was not a very popular discipline of medicine, we were all his students. He brought a certain glamour to the whole discipline. I do remember his classes even today, a few things from his classes. A, he would bring in a number of people who all looked normal to the class. And he would ask these patients of his, whom we didn't know were patients, to tell the stories. And we would be wondering, why is he bringing all these people? They're all absolutely normal looking people. And only when they started telling the stories, Somewhere along the line, about three minutes, four minutes later, we'll know that, oh, there's something wrong. You know, subtle issues coming out. And the point he made to us was that mental health is not easily, mental illness is not easily detected. And I think we could have no better example of that than the recent tragedy that we all saw in the papers about the German airlines, you know, the German wings. It's a classical example of how it can be concealed even from the most probing agencies. And Professor Ramchandran taught us a few lessons which we carry in our practice even today. One of his quotes, which I remember, I carry in my mind, is he once told us, a group of students, remember as a doctor, you will cure 50% of your patients you may ameliorate another 20%. And 30%, you may be able to do nothing. But in 100% of patients, as a doctor, you can empathize. And that's a lesson we all carry, even today. That's a very important lesson. 
And that's a lesson that no other person other than a gentleman of his stature could have given to us. And we carried it in our mind. So for that alone, I am grateful to him. I'm delighted that the students of his, eminent doctors in their own right, have got together to perpetuate his memory by forming this trust, which is going to help society. I don't think we could have given a better tribute. And this is in the noblest of medical traditions of students honoring their teachers. I I'd congratulate them for this. Now finally, in fact, the organizers are very clear about the demarcation. They said talks and felicitation. I'm felicitating, so it means you better stick to your time. You know, it's not too long. Finally, to follow up on what Mr. Krishna said about the quest for happiness, I have been asking questions in my mind about what is happiness. And I think it's a, my answer is very simple. Everything that you see on this planet, every one of us, animate, inanimate, has a reason for existence. The French have a beautiful term for it, the raison d'etre, the reason for existence. And when one realizes the reason for his existence and is able to pursue a life towards achieving the goal to achieve the reason for his existence, the reason for his existence, if you can achieve it, you have achieved happiness. I realized this, in a way, quite suddenly, about 20 years ago, when I came face to face with a young man who had tried to commit suicide. This youngster had lost his hearing in both ears, suddenly. He had just finished school, 12th standard, from a very poor family, son of a teacher, secondary school teacher. He lost his hearing after an attack of mom's. Suddenly, a gregarious, outgoing, out, outstandingly brilliant young man became a complete recluse who could not communicate, profoundly deaf. So he, his mother, his father, all three of them consumed poison. And when this happened, they, luckily for them, they survived. And when the psychiatrist went and counseled them, they said, why should we live? You know, what is the reason? The only son has become deaf. So the psychiatrist phoned me up. He said, look, is there something that you can do? You know, you're an ENT surgeon. So that's the time we did the first cochlear implant in this country to give hearing. The boy on switch on, he was sitting in a silent room. The air conditioner was on. He looked at me and he said, the AC is making noise. So I knew that day the reason for my existence. And from that day, I have pursued the goal to give hearing. And recently, I achieved my happiness. How did I achieve it? A young boy at the age of two was implanted in 97. Today, he, two months, three months ago, he came a six-footer, very handsome, smart-looking young man, came and patted me on the shoulder. And he said, Doc, how are you, Doc? I said, I'm fine, son. Thank you. How are you? He said, I'm fine. So I said, what are you doing? He's a, a graduate student at the Harvard Law School. How many people with hearing in this country can aspire to do that? To me, that day, I knew what happiness was. So I think, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to conclude by congratulating the, the organizers as well as the, the movers behind this wonderful effort. I think they need all our support because end of the day, a society is assessed not by the number of satellites it puts up on the orbit, but by how it treats the most marginalized people in society and what fate awaits them. And we are the society and we have a right and we have a moral duty to support these people. Let's do that by supporting Sanmati. Thank you very much.